Hello, this is Arun Kadekodi here, the organizing co-chair for this conference. Um, welcome back and to the session, what we've all been waiting for. And uh, this uh, session will be chaired by Vipul Shah, who's the host tonight. He heads the education and skilling as part of the global CSR at Tata Consultancy Services, and uh, as well as the CS Patshal Initiative. So without much ado, let's get into it. And Vipul, you can take over from here. Uh, thank you, Arun. So hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to the special session of CTIS 2020 conference. I mean, I would like to thank you for the overwhelming response to the CTIS conference and the earlier webinar series. I think barring the few technical glitches, and I know there were a few today, we had a wonderful, excellent day today. Uh, I think uh, before I uh, before continuing, a few housekeeping rules. Uh, we are in a webinar mode, so everybody is on silent. And as always, post your questions to in the Q&A window. We'll take the questions at the end of the talk. Uh, the session is also live streamed on YouTube, CS Parchala channel. So, as you know, ACM is the world's largest computing society and has been at the forefront of computing education. I'd like to quickly remind you of all the good things, uh, they are good things that ACM is doing, as well as good things that ACM India is doing, including the CS Parshala initiative. We have come a long way in the CS Parshala journey, and I'd like to thank you for that. Interacting with all of you at CTIS is, was really energizing, uh, and it just kind of motivates us to continue down this along down this path. So just to summarize for all the people who have not been on the earlier call, uh, we launched this initiative in 2016 to promote computational thinking in schools. And uh, now we have 30,000 schools Chennai, uh, who are uh, following computational thinking curriculum, which is integrated as part of their math curriculum. In addition to this, we have been working directly with 300,000 students in the rest of the country. Uh, two thirds of these students are from government schools in rural areas. Uh, I think the other goal for us was to influence policy, shape a curriculum, develop teaching aids. And I think I should say that we our advocacy efforts have been paid, have paid off, and the draft national education and the national education policy uh, recommends teaching CT curriculum and uh, CT. And we also have developed a curriculum, and the content is available for free for the teachers to download. Training has been important, and we have conducted large number of training programs, and number of teachers have uh, participated in the training. It's my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker for tonight, Professor Janet Wing, joining us all the way from New York. Thank you for that, Janet. Really speaking, she needs no introduction. I think any and every paper you take, every article you read, every mention of computational thinking, all of them refer to her seminal essay of 2006 titled Computational Thinking. It is credited with helping to establish the centrality of uh, computer science to problem solving especially in the fields where previously it had not been embraced. Uh, she is uh, Evan Sheehan's Director of Data Science Institute and the Professor of Computer Science at Columbia University. She was a Corporate Vice President at uh, Microsoft Research and is a JEC Professor of Computer Science at Carnegie, where she twice served as Head of Computer Science Department. Her current interests are in foundations of security and privacy with new focus on trustworthy AI. She is and has been chair and or member of many academic, government, and industry advisory boards. She has received the CRA Distinguished Service Award as well as the ACM Distinguished Service Award. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, American Association for the Advancement of Science, ACM, and the Institute of uh, IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineering. So I'm quite excited, and I'm sure all of you are. So please join me in extending a warm welcome to Janet. And Janet, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so Vipul, let me share my screen. Great, wonderful. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to give this presentation on computational thinking. Um, to be honest, when I see what you've already done in India since, since even before 2016, but 
for sure with uh, this um, CS path. Um, I, I'm not really sure I have much more to add, um, but I will for sure give you my thinking about computational thinking and leave time for questions at the end of my talk. Um, I want to be very honest with all of you in the audience that the talk I'm going to give is a talk I've given many, many times over the years, and it hasn't changed. Uh, so for those of you who've seen me before I give this talk, you're going to see it again. Um, and for those of you who haven't, it really goes to say that the idea of computational thinking is quite persistent. Um, and uh, it, it, the, the one big change is how much uptake there has been to this idea by schools, colleges, universities around the world. And I'm very gratified by everyone's efforts to make that happen. And I wanna thank organizations like ACM, ACM India for also helping to make that happen. So now let me share my screen. Computational thinking. I have a grand vision, and it is people like you who are helping me realize that vision. So thank you very much. My grand vision is that computational thinking will be a fundamental skill used by everyone in the world by the middle of the 21st century. Remember, I stated this vision in about 2006. Um, it's already 14 years later, and I think we've made great progress towards realizing this vision. What I mean by fundamental skill is just as fundamental as reading, writing, and arithmetic. And it's, of course, a bit of an incestuous vision because computing and computers will help spread the, the, the computational thinking. And I think we see in the age of the pandemic of COVID-19 um, we would not be able to spread anything uh, intellectual without computing. And I really credit the technology community for allowing us to have this virtual conference and for me to speak to all of you, uh, no matter what time zones we're in. With respect to research, my vision means really reaching not just the science and engineering communities, which of course, use comp computing in their daily lives, but even the non-technical communities like historians and artists. In education, which is very much the focus of all of you, um, uh, of course, I, I think computational thinking will be important at the undergraduate level and PhD level, but the DARE, was to really see how it can be inculcated in the teaching of K through 12 students um, and uh, how teachers in K through 12 can uh, teach such students. I, I know when I say K through 12, you say school, so that's what I mean. So as Vipal mentioned, I wrote this three page essay uh, in 2006 um, and uh, I should update that web link because now I'm at Columbia, not at Carnegie Mellon. Um, but it's a very easy read. I hope all of you have read it. Um, and I feel like it is what helped inspire the movement uh, that now I can very much look back on and, and be very gratified by. So what do I mean by computational thinking? Um, Right now, I use this definition. Computational thinking is the thought processes involved in formulating a problem and expressing its solution or solutions in such a way that a computer, and a computer could be a human or a machine, or more interestingly, the combination of a human and machine working together, can effectively carry out. This is actually a very carefully crafted definition. Each word uh, is, is important. So first of all, it's about thought processes, which means it is about what you do in your head. 
formulating a problem is about expressing a problem. Uh, we're not even up to expressing solutions. We just need to formulate the problem. Um, and the point is we want to formulate a problem such that eventually um, we know that a computer can carry out the solution. So as you know, in problem solving, half the problem is formulating the problem properly. The second piece of this is expressing its solution. Um, by expressing, this really brings in all the power of computer science, especially in terms of programming languages, specification languages, um, and all the ways in which humans communicate with machines. So expressing its solution is quite key to this definition. Now, as you know, a problem may have many ways of being solved. And that's why I put into, uh, I emphasize that there may be multiple solutions to a problem. And then, uh, as I mentioned, a computer can be a human. So we can do computational thinking without using machines. Uh, machines are better at some things than humans are. And so we often think about computational thinking in terms of how we're gonna get the machine to solve the problem. Um, and then more interestingly is what I mentioned earlier, where humans and machines work together to solve problems that neither can solve alone. And finally, the word effectively really appeals to, it's gotta be computationally uh, tractable uh, for the computer to, to carry out the solution. Otherwise, it's just not interesting. If we have to wait centuries for the solution, then it's not a, a useful solution. So effectively really does hark back to what is uh, computable. The critical thought process behind computational thinking is abstraction. And I like to think about computational thinking as an interplay between coming up in our heads with abstractions and executing those abstractions in some computer, usually it's a machine. So it's a way to automate the execution of those abstractions. Now, philosophically, of course, computational thinking both complements and combines mathematical and engineering thinking. Computational thinking draws on mathematics as its foundations, much like computer science draws on, its, on mathematics as its foundations. But uh, unlike in mathematics, in computing, we actually are constrained by the physics of the underlying machine. Now, if it's a, an, um, you know, a physical machine, then like a computer that we would call a device, then of course we're constrained by even things like um, how we can represent numbers uh, in a bounded uh, uh, amount of um, bits. Um, of course, if we're talking about a human as a machine, we don't even understand the physics, the constraints of the physics of our human brain. Computational thinking also draws on engineering because the systems that we build, the computing systems we build, don't work in isolation usually. They interact with the real world. So we engineer the computing systems uh, with full awareness that they need to uh, interact with the physical world. Um, However, one big difference between computer science and all other engineering disciplines like electrical engineering, civil engineering, mechanical engineering, and so on, is that in computer science with computing, we can build virtual worlds, worlds that are actually unconstrained by the physical reality. And we do this all the time when you're playing some video game, 
uh, your work, you're operating in a virtual world where avatars can uh, die and come alive again, or where you avatars can fly and defy the laws of nature and defy the laws of physics. So in fact, computational thinking, um, computational thinking is only bounded uh, by the creativity of our own mind. Uh, we can build a world in virtual space that can do anything. Uh, and I think this is the excitement and joy of computer science. Computational thinking, when I talk about it, is more about the concepts of behind computer science uh, and not the artifacts like the software and the hardware that we build. Um, and the idea is that with these concepts, we can approach daily life um, armed with these problem solving skills. So I do believe philosophically it is for everyone, for everywhere. Now, what do I mean a little more specifically about these concepts? This laundry list of computational concepts um, is what you might typically find in a computer science curriculum. And that's not surprising because when I use the term computational thinking, I really mean thinking like a computer scientist. On the other hand, I don't expect everyone in the world to study computer science. I think there are a few concepts that everyone can learn and benefit from knowing that uh, can uh, uh, that would be good enough to get you started in computational thinking. Things like algorithms, um, logic, uh, and so on. I, I list these concepts, um, and I don't want to go through all of these because they will probably look very familiar to you. I list these concepts to make a distinction that computational thinking is not what some people might call computer or digital literacy. It's not how to use Word or Excel. That's not at all what I mean by computational thinking. It also goes beyond computer programming. So computational thinking um, is not computer programming. It's not learning how to program in Java or how to program in Python. Of course, when you learn how to program in Java and when you learn how to program in Python, you are using computational thinking skills, but com computational thinking goes way beyond that. And I also want to remind people that uh, you, you don't need to be programming to be doing computational thinking. So now what I wanna do is go through a few examples of computational thinking in other disciplines to show the breadth of applicability. Um, again, some of these examples are gonna seem a little dated because uh, computer science really has pervaded all other disciplines at this point. And uh, I almost feel like when talking about science and engineering disciplines and even the arts and humanities in terms of digital um, uh, skill sets, um, it's, in, it's 2020 and we have come a long way since 2006. So what I will first suggest is that there's one discipline that has really benefited from many, many computational methods. And if I were in um, an audience in, in the physical room and all of you were in front of me, I would at this point ask for a show of hands or someone to, in the audience to say, what one discipline might I have in mind? But I'll just tell you, it's of course biology. And I think it was really the turn of the century when we figured out how to sequence the human genome with an algorithm. Uh, sh the shotgun algorithm actually expedited the sequencing of the human genome that the biology community sat up and say, hey, you computer scientists have something to offer me in how I can do my science. And then there are many, many other concepts and tools and languages and models that, by, uh, that the computer science community has come up with that has 
that have been used to tackle some of the biggest challenges in biology, whether it's understanding uh, DNA sequences, whether it's understanding cancer, um, whether it's understanding the protein level of interactions um, or higher level uh, biological behaviors in, in terms of organisms and populations. Um, and the insight that all of these models and languages and tools share is that these models and languages for expressing computational processes are good for expressing the dynamics of biological processes. So that's why you see examples here like uh, language or networks or calculi or state machines. Let me give you a very small example, and this is already a few years old, where doing stem cell prediction um, was done by using a um, state machine model, essentially, of uh, biological computation, uh, which takes three inputs um, and produces an output. And the idea is that in the, we know from biology that embryonic cells um, are self-renewing uh, pl and pluripotent. So self-renewing means they divide indefinitely and pluripotent means they generate all the adult cell types and then can be re-injected back into the developing embryo. And it's also known that we can actually reprogram these adult cells to the embryonic state. And the hope is if we know how to program the adult cells to this embryonic state, can we then um, program it to generate a brain cell or a heart cell or a lung cell? That is you know, a holy grail in biology. Um, but if we know how to program these cells to do what we want them to do, much like we can program a computer to do what we want it to do, then this would be uh, transformative for biology. So there, um, we can represent uh, one of these cells essentially as a, um, a Boolean network, um, or if you, can, if you like, you can think of it as a state machine. It has these three inputs, uh, it does some processing, there's some feedback, um, and on that's the left-hand uh, uh, picture where there are three signals. On the right, you see that certain genetic information is lit up more depending on the combination of the si signals. And we can express that in um, this map, uh, which uh, biologists are very familiar with, um, on the lower left, in terms of a Boolean network, which computer scientists are much more familiar with. And then we can actually feed this Boolean network into a satisfiability modulo theory engine, uh, which in fact is built on a tool called Z3, and uh, synthesize only those out of the 10 to the 43 Boolean networks that satisfy experimental constraints. So we have this Boolean network that suggests that there are 10 to the 43 combinations that we need to consider, but we don't need to consider all 10 to the 43 because we have some experiments that we've run and we can use these experiments as constraints and then just isolate the essence of the Boolean network where for instance, the essence of this Boolean network um, says that you only have to consider um, these 17 nodes um, and these connections between these nodes um, because all of this, this, the essence of the bigger Boolean network are the ones that satisfy all the constraints of all the experiments we've done already. And so this set was used to make a large number of non-intuitive predictions of the response of the network to genetic perturbations. And these predictions then were experimentally validated with over a 70% accuracy rate. So this is an example 
of different ways in which co computer science or computational thinking concepts have um, helped the biologists think about what they do on a, a routine basis. And more importantly, um, it helps them discover new biology in ways that would have been hard for them to do otherwise. So now let me talk about um, other disciplines. I'm just gonna talk about, um, you know, before I talked about one discipline uh, that many methods in computer science have helped uh, advance um, biology. Now I wanna talk about one method that has pervaded almost all disciplines. And again, if I were physically in front of you, I would ask the audience, what one method do you think this is? And I think everyone would shout out loud machine learning. Machine learning has certainly transformed the field of statistics um, and the combination of statistical machine learning and computing um, has transformed every other discipline. Um, I am now the director of data science and a key component of data science is of course AI and machine learning. And I am seeing this transformation throughout the entire university at Columbia, which is uh, a, a full-fledged university, not just a science and technology university. So machine learning in the sciences, um, we have made new discoveries in astronomy. Um, it is been it is being used for um, diagnosis, uh, for images for in medicine, um, for instance, in mammography, um, uh, images of your heart, images of your brain. Um, it's been used to predict where tornadoes might form in meteorology, um, and it it's, continues to be used um, a lot in the neurosciences uh, primarily because of image analysis. I wanted to do one plug for a conference that I'm running uh, in December called Machine Learning and Science and Engineering. So in 2006, when I was purporting the importance of machine learning, this was before the advent of deep learning and how machine learning and big data has really taken off. Since then, of course, it's par for the course. Uh, every other science and engineering discipline is using machine learning, trying to use machine learning, and so on. So in this conference coming up in December, um, we have a phenomenal slate of keynote speakers, Bill Daly, Barbara Engelhardt, who's a biologist, David Hogg, who's an astronomer, um, a physicist, Cynthia Rudin, who's a statistical machine learning expert, Bill Daly, as you know, um, is a hardware expert uh, working at NVIDIA um, and helping us process the data with fast GPUs. You'll see there are 11 tracks that we have for this conference, which goes to show how every engineering and science dis discipline is really ha has really been affected by machine learning. Um, so again, this is just one computational method that already has transformed so many science and engineering disciplines. I wanted to say, and I'm, uh, I wanted to say to the students and the postdocs in the audience, registration for this event is free. So um, please do uh, check out the website. Machine learning is also used in our daily lives. So it's obviously used to detect fraud in credit card usage. It's used to figure out what coupons to give us in the supermarket. Uh, it's been used for doing financial analysis and market prediction and risk analysis on Wall Street. Uh, it is used to, in the recommendation systems that tell us what movie do we want to watch or what book we want to buy. Um, it's used in sports to better help coaches train their athletes. Uh, one of the key uh, advances in machine learning in the past few years is, of course, deep neural networks. Um, and I was uh, fortunate to be, and for, for those of you who are unfamiliar, this is what a typical deep neural network might look like. But on the left, what we saw, um, and I was uh, in, in the audience to witness this, 
was a true advancement using DNNs on speech recognition, um, where the word error rate went from almost 30% uh, to uh, dropping to just over uh, 10% um, in a short period of time. And you'll, the reason this was so dramatic to the speech recognition community is look at that plateau between 1999 and 2009. In other words, before DNNs were used for speech recognition, no progress was being made at all. And then all of a sudden there was tremendous progress. So I happened to be in the audience when Rick Rashid was on the stage in uh, Tianjin, China, where he spoke. In real time, his speech was transcribed into English text. In real time, that was translated into Chinese. In real time, a voice synthesizer uh, spoke Chinese. Um, in Rick's voice. Um, and I was in the audience. I was not at Microsoft at the time. I was still at Carnegie Mellon, but I was among an audience of thousands of students um, who were so moved by what they were witnessing, uh, there were tears in their eyes. And I knew I was, and this is 2012, I knew I was at the start of a revolution uh, and sure enough that, that we've all seen this in deep learning, DNNs, convolutional neural networks, uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, it's, it's really transformed many of the IT companies. And now everyone wants AI, whether you're in manufacturing or finance or healthcare. Um, and of course, Microsoft took this idea, put it into the Skype translator, um, right away, and so that people could have real-time conversations with each other, speaking their own native language. Um, so this is quite a historic moment. What about computational thinking in the sciences and beyond? Um, I've ar already argued about machine learning, but other kinds of computational methods are used in, in the sciences in chemistry, um, optimization and search algorithms are used to identify the best chemicals for improving reaction conditions. In physics, um, there's a, a kind of quantum computing called adiabatic quantum computing and theoretical computer scientists have under, uh, analyzed convergence rates of adiabatic quantum computing, asking questions of does this converge and how effective are these um, processes that physicists wouldn't even think of asking. Um, in the geosciences, uh, a lot of work has been done on um, the obviously using computing for simulating the earth systems um, and uh, many of the computational platforms that the climate scientists rely on um, are in indispensable. In mathematics, uh, we have been using computers to actually prove theorems that have been outstanding or discovering new mathematical structures. And in engineering, again, we can't go, we can't, in our engineering sector, we can't live without computing. What's interesting to me is many, many years ago in electrical engineering, when you teach um, circuit design, you start with linear circuits, you might have an approximation up to maybe the first order, um, and then you stop there because it was really hard to compute beyond that uh, as a human. Right now, we just use computer programs to compute and calculate as many orders as we, uh, as we wish so that we can be more precise, um, and that leads to um, other engineering decisions in terms of cost and weight and so on. So this, uh, the use of com computation has really changed the engineering discipline and also the teaching of engineering. And in terms of uh, computational thinking for um, other disciplines outside of the science and engineering, um, I have witnessed at Microsoft a huge uh, interest by the economist in using uh, automated mechanism design for designing marketplaces, for um, 
using machine learning uh, and big data to uh, improve uh, the model prediction power for pricing uh, when uh, they're doing causal reasoning. Um, in law, a lot of the interest is actually in analyzing text, um, but there have been other uh, forays of using comp computing uh, because lawyers actually think quite logically um, and uh, a program is uh, a, a computer language is one way to help them express that logic. Um, and in healthcare, of course, uh, uh, in, in the, both in research, but also in, in the clinic, uh, we, wouldn't, we, we wouldn't be able to live without some of the computing power that we have. Um, in archaeology, a lot of this work has been in the digitization of our artifacts so that people can enjoy um, vir virtual visits to these um, churches or caves um, and see sculptures and statues and, and so on without actually have to, having to be there. Um, I should mention for journalism, of course, uh, one of the um, consequences of the digitization of data and the pervasiveness of uh, the ability to disseminate data so easily is something that I think the computing and technology computing, uh, community didn't anticipate, and that is uh, the unfortunate ease of spreading fake news. Um, and then in the humanities, there are whole departments now in uh, major universities on digital humanities. Um, again, a lot of that is about text analysis using natural language processing um, and just the ability to search um, and digest a lot of documents that one could not do as a human being alone. In computational social science, let me just give you an example of um, one example of uh, learning about crowd workers, online marketplaces, um, there's a, they, this group of people actually looked at uh, Amazon Mechanical Turkers, uh, both in the United States and in India. And what they found was that by looking at just the data, they found some interesting, uh, they, they observed some interesting um, uh, behavior. First, that the data supports this notion of imperfect competition. Um, and another way to say that is the data says that online labor markets are monopsonies. A monopsony is where you have one buyer and multiple sellers. The opposite of a monopoly where you have one seller and multiple buyers. Another uh, result from this work was to say that you'd think that uh, Amazon Mechanical Turkers would go after the high paying tasks because you make more money doing one of those tasks. But in fact, uh, they didn't. They go after a lot of the low paying tasks. So make a lot of money by doing a lot of little uh, low paying tasks. So just by looking at the data, um, you can uh, one can observe um, non-intuitive uh, market conditions. Now, let me turn to an example in daily life that I like to use. It was from my National Science Foundation days when I was getting my morning coffee at the cafeteria. And this was how the coffee station was set up. Uh, that was me in the lower left-hand corner. I would go and get a cup. I'd put some milk in the cup. Um, I'd put my coffee in the cup. I'd put, get some sugar um, and then get a lid and then get my napkin and leave. So as a computer scientist or as a computational thinker, I think, well, there's something wrong with this coffee station. Um, and again, if I were in, in a physical room, I would ask all of you to shout out, you know, what computational thinking concept comes to mind that can help me make this coffee station more efficient? Um, and by the way, so this was my path, um, if there's someone in your way who wants to get coffee at the same time, then it's really inefficient because I will have to wait for someone to get moved from the uh, 
the getting his cup when I'm trying to get my lid and it's just not the best way to set up a coffee station. So by now I hope you figured out what do I need to do to make this more efficient. And of course a computational thinkers first thing one thinks about is how do I make something more efficient? That's that's where computational thinking comes into real life. Now I've given the audience enough time to figure out what computational thinking concept I might be thinking of. And that is of course pipelining. So what you really wanna do is move the lids over to the left. And then you have this nice streamlined movement where I'm not overlapping in my own path. And therefore um, people can basically queue up into this coffee station and smoothly get the, the cup, the milk, this coffee, the sugar, the lids and the napkins without bumping into each other. And this is something that, you know, of course I told the National Science Foundation uh, cashier, I, I, I have a better idea for how to set up your coffee station. And I was telling the person we should move the lids from the right to the left. And of, of course they all ignored me. <laughs> Okay, so what about computational thinking and education? Um, I do think that there are some fundamental uh, research questions still for the computing community, which is how is it, how should, can we best teach computational thinking to K through 12? Of course, all of you are doing that. Um, by now, after four to 10 years of practice, you probably have a good answer to this. But the kinds of questions I was asking, or I continue to ask are, what are the concepts that students can best learn when? You know, when, what is our analogy to numbers in kindergarten and algebra in seventh grade and calculus in 12th grade? I don't think we really have an answer to that. I think the computer science community needs to work, learn, work with the education community to help figure out uh, what is the right uh, time to teach which concept. And the other is, of course, how to integrate the real computer, the machine, in teaching these concepts. We know just throwing a computer in the classroom is not the right thing to do. But how can we, and when can we, when should we introduce the computer, and how should we introduce the functionality that the computer offers as a student's maturity um, in, in understanding mathematical concepts and computing concepts um, grows, grows. So computer scientists, I think, do need to work with educators and cognitive learning scientists to answer these fundamental questions. Meanwhile, of course, I think you're doing all the right things and that we can't wait for the research to be done um, because so, the world changes so quickly. Uh, and so we do need to kind of um, do this in parallel. And that's, of course, what all of you are doing. In the US, there's some efforts similar to what you have in India. Um, I would say that they continue to march along. The US is a lot more uh, decentralized than many other countries. There are 10,000 school districts in the United States and to have a movement where computational thinking takes over all of the K through 12 uh, teaching uh, really means convincing one school district, one at a time, that this is the right thing to do. Um, there is a goal in the US shared by many of the organizations that I showed you in the previous slide, and that is to give access to computer science to every high school student. Um, and so locally, some regions like New York, Chicago, Washington State, San Francisco, have um, basically formulated their own policies that speak to this US goal. Um, and even President Obama in his 2016 State of, Un of the Union address uh, mentioned the importance of offering every student the hands-on computer science and math class that make them job ready on day one. Um, and so this is really quite, if this was quite inspiring and gratifying for me to hear. Um, and the UK is probably the, the country that led the way for the whole world through the British Royal Society 2012 report, Shut Down or Restart, 
where it mentions that computational thinking was important for every child to learn in school. And this is something that, of course, you are trying to do in India. Um, so computing at school was created um, and, and by, seven, by September 2014, it was introduced as a requirement in the K through 12 curriculum. There are, of course, other international efforts um, I recognize India by your flag, um, and there are other countries, so there's India again, uh, other countries that have come along. Um, so I, my little three-page article has been translated into various languages, um, and I think that has probably helped spread the word throughout the world about the importance of computational thinking. So let me close by thanking all of you for helping me spread the word and helping make computational thinking commonplace. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janet. I really enjoyed the talk and uh, I think so did all the participants. I think there are many things in your talk and I'm still thinking about all the possible applications that you had uh, highlighted and listed. But I think a few things stuck, me, uh, stuck with me. I mean, you spoke about everyone, everywhere. I think that was very, very that was key and very important. And I think the message that you gave that uh, computational thinking is, uh, it's like, we're all about thinking like a computer scientist. Because a lot of people get confused in terms of trying to define as to are you trying to do what the computer is doing? And I think by distinguishing that, I think it makes it uh, uh, clear. And I think in the morning we had uh, Sridhar Ayer from IIT Bombay who uh, gave a talk. Uh, and he also we, he had a poll question on, uh, you I think raised the point that CT is not programming. And I think his poll question also, uh, he had asked similar question in terms of, uh, do people consider CTS programming? And what was heartening to note was that a large number of our participants uh, said that no C programming is not CT and CT is far more far encompassing than that. Uh, you mentioned about CSTA. So I think I should just share with you, uh, Jake Baskin uh, uh, is going to be uh, speaking on CSTA tomorrow uh, at one of, at, at the CTIS conference tomorrow to share with us uh, the work that they are doing in uh, US and uh, elsewhere. So uh, I think uh, let me start with a few questions uh, uh, till we, we, I think there are some more questions coming up. So I think I'll read out the question to you. I think so you mentioned about, uh, I really like the research question that you posed at the end. I think one of them was uh, what concepts can students best learn at what age? and it would be lovely to get your thoughts on that. What have yeah, I'd like to. I like to thank you for letting me speak a little bit more about that point, because um, we we of course have been teaching mathematics for for centuries, and you would think actually by now we have figured at, it out. Although I I know in the United States there are still math wars on how best to teach mathematics, but for the most part we understand that. Um, at least, you know, you, you teach you, you teach arithmetic, um, you teach addition and subtraction, and then multiplication and division, uh, fractions, and so on. And then by the time uh, you're 12 years old or so, uh, India, uh, my guess is that you teach algebra even sooner than in the United States. But by the time you're 12 years old, your mental uh, cognitive ability is... Uh, strong enough to learn algebra, which takes symbolic reasoning. Um, and then the next year, I, I remember when I was growing up, we learned geometry. Um, and then we learned uh, trigonometry and then calculus. And of course, each of these mathematics built on, you better know algebra before you learn trigonometry, right? Uh, you better know that before you go into calculus. So we kind of figured this out for mathematics and similarly for physics. And by the way, in physics in the United States, the reason we figured it out is that we were forced to uh, when the United States had its Sputnik moment. Um, and all of a sudden people were doing uh, research on physics education, um, which concepts in physics come first, um, 
Uh, and then which can we teach later? So you don't teach quantum physics first, <laughs> you teach statics uh, and, and so on. So my point was, what about computer science? And I always thought, well, you know, when we teach long division, for instance, to fourth graders, so we teach long division to nine-year-olds, we don't use we don't use the word algorithm. But what we're teaching them is a specific algorithm, usually, you know, to divide um, one number into the other to get a quotient and remainder. We even teach them a way to check your answer. So this is beautiful. It's an opportunity for nine-year-olds to learn the word algorithm. And actually, once you're empowered with the concept of an algorithm, you know, then you're, you le you're learning more than long division. You, you are empowered with a bigger concept. And you might even come up with a different algorithm for doing long division or a different way to check your answer. Um, and that would be at nine years old. But I don't really know. I am not a learning scientist. I'm not an educator. And I don't know whether it's too early to teach that high level concept of algorithm to a nine year old. So I was telling this story and at some other talk I gave and someone in the audience came up to me later and he, he said to me, Jeanette, it's not too early to teach the notion of an algorithm to a nine year old. I do some uh, tutoring at my daughter's you know, elementary school and I've taught them all sorts of different data structures. Uh, now, if you can teach trees and cues and stacks and lists to nine and 10 years old, then, are, then that means we can teach them algorithms because why use one versus another? So that gave me a lot of hope. But again, we're all kind of, we as computer scientists kind of shooting in the dark because we really don't know how children mature in their uh, mathematical sophistication. So that's a, an example of what I think we need to figure out. Um, and I think we are, uh, you know, as the teachers in the audience are doing, and as um, you know, principals and policymakers are doing, we're kind of uh, experimenting right now. Um, and so we, we will, you know, experimentation is good. And I, the good thing is that so many countries are doing this, we can learn from each other. Absolutely. And, and, and since you mentioned long division, let me share with you that uh, one of the presentations today, we had teachers who were exactly talking about this and how it was helping the students uh, understand the algorithm and following. I think they, they I think what they were trying to bring out is that uh, they were now using a systematic application, uh, how they were applying, identifying all the steps that needed to uh, be applied as an algorithm and then help them solve the problems better and correctly. Yeah. So uh, I, I have a question uh, from Poonam here. Uh, can you just can you mention how one can begin computational thinking uh, at the school level in economics? Because economics is quite basic. Oh, so I'm not an economist. I I I, uh, I I hesitate to really speak with any authority here. Um, I think the first thing to think about in any discipline is. What are, uh, you know, one can say, what would be something that um, would, could be best expressed um, algorithmically? That's the first easy sort of thing to do. Um, and, uh, you know, in econ economics, one are, is also usually also talking about trade-offs. Um, and so you can also talk about uh, trade-offs when you're making trade-offs in computing between um, space and time, between maybe uh, efficiency and convenience, or you know, there in system design you talk about trade-offs. So um, you can. So that's those are just two 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 simple answers. I would have to think more about that because I actually 
I did take an economics course in high school, but I don't remember too much of what I learned. Uh, um, so I would have to, you know, talk to an economics high school or, or school teacher to know actually what is being taught and how to understand better how computational thinking might help. So there's one question here. Uh, the question is, why do you think CT is as basic as literacy for everyone in the world? I think we have certainly, um, I, I would say it, it this way, computing technology is pervasive. Um, and I have seen, I've witnessed many students who have not taken or been exposed to computational thinking um, disadvantaged at the in the workplace. Um, first of all, uh, they may not even get um, the opportunity to interview for a particular position. And it, it's not with an IT company. It could be in any company. But if you have the computational thinking skills, and even as basic as programming skills, and I, I don't want to demean the importance of having programming skills, um, but if you are not facile with computing, then I do think you are disadvantaged in uh, job opportunities and then doing well in the workplace. Once you are in a workplace, those with the computing skills um, are going to be able to perform more efficiently uh, and see opportunities to automate some of the processes that we do manually. To be honest, I see that a lot in some of the work that um, staff people do um, where they may be manually doing something over and over again and not realize, oh, I could write a little script to do that. Uh, even that is computational thinking to realize, oh, I am doing something pretty routine that is actually faster done, more accurately uh, done if I write a little script to do it. That idea of just saying I can write a little script to do that is where computational thinking comes to play. Thank you. There's one more question. We speak a lot about introducing computational thinking in K-12. And what are your thoughts on promoting computational thinking at undergraduate level uh, or at graduate levels uh, in universities? I think that, to be honest, it's almost already a given. At the graduate level, certainly in science and engineering, um, most, most I, I would say, graduate students um, can't can't do their field without having some computational uh, skills. And I, I, I think that, that they just learn them on, on, on the job because they know they have to. Uh, I think more interesting, so at the graduate level, I think it's just a given. I think maybe for the non-science engineering uh, graduate students, it, it may be less of a given. Um, and then I would just say, you know, the, the world is becoming digital. Uh, everything is being digitized. And everyone has data, whether you're an artist, humanities, historian, scholar, his, uh, history scholar, uh, everything is becoming digitized. And if you don't realize the power of using computing um, at scale to the data that you are generating, collecting, reading, analyzing, then you, again, um, will be less competitive than your fellow uh, scholars in your discipline. So I think the the fields are the field the disciplines are waking up and i actually think data is the common language now that people are recognizing oh um, i generate or i read a lot of data how can machines help me uh, uh do more so i think once the graduate once the disciplines are recognizing that this will happen at the graduate level at the undergraduate level in fact students speak with their feet uh, so Columbia University is, is very well known for its uh, economics, political science, history, sociology. Um, but the, the second highest major at Columbia University last year was computer science. So, oh. you know, 
And and yes. this is the majors. And, and right. the non-majors were all taking computing courses because they knew it was to their best interest for the future to learn these skills. And Thanks. that's at an so Ivy League school like Columbia. You know, at a, a, a <laughs> university like Carnegie Mellon, Every student is required to take a computing course, <laughs> except, except for the drama students. So there's one exception. The drama <laughs> students are waived from that requirement. But every other student, and that's a technical school, you know, whether you're in, um, you know, majoring in English or art, you have to take a computing course. Wonderful. So I think we have time for probably just one Last question or two. Uh, there's a question from Shridhar. Uh, on one hand, CT is not just programming. On the other hand, CT is not all of problem-solving strategies. Uh, what would be your position on this? Yeah, I mean, I I, I agree with that. Uh, you know, mathematics, of course, brings in engineering and mathematics bring in a lot of problem-solving strategies. Um, and the only one I'm really harping on, if you will, are, are those where computing um, uh, computation can help. Computing with a machine can help. Sure, thanks. So just one more question here, last one, I think. Uh, CT complements well with physical computing and school children enjoy learning it to see the thoughts that can be transformed into moving parts of a machine. Uh, what would be your experience on using CT with physical computing? Any thoughts on that? So I, I think perhaps the question ha relates to robots. Um, I, 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 and I think robots are a wonderful way to make computational, uh, computational uh, physical, visible, tangible. So uh, robots are a wonderful way to help students learn computational thinking, especially when you can program the robot to do what you want. Um, not everyone is going to be comfortable, you know, working with robots or mechanical devices um, and programming a, a, a physical machine. Uh, so I think whether you're programming a, uh, programming a computer to spit out something on your screen in more software oriented ways or programming a robot, I think we need to remember that children especially learn in different ways. Uh, and just to be concrete, um, I fell in love with computer science because of Lambda Calculus, uh, not because I enjoyed programming in PL1 or, or uh, Pascal or whatever the language was of the day. Um, I, 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 I fell in love with computer science because of the mathematics underlying the field. Um, and so remember that there are people out there um, that may, may not want to program a robot. On the other hand, there are a lot of people who really enjoy programming robots and then fall in love with computer science. So we need to remember to be open-minded about how to reach all kinds of children, all kinds of learners. Thank you. So I think um, there are many more questions, but I don't know if you have time, maybe one more. I think I, ha uh, I have to go. I have another meeting to okay. go to. All right. <laughs> um, but thank you very right, much for I this opportunity. Uh, it was a delight to speak to this audience. And again, I want to thank all of you in the audience who have been helping to spread computational thinking. I thank all of you very much. Bye-bye. So uh, thanks you. Thank you so much, Janet. Thanks for the excellent talk. It was very inspiring and there were a lot of learnings for us. And thank you again for joining us all the way from New York. And thanks to the audience for attending the webinar. Uh, goodbye. Good night. Bye-bye.